Hey y'all, it's David, welcome back to my channel. And I took a month off of YouTube and was uploading sermons that I preached. Starting in the fall, I opened up a holiness series and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, I've been uploading some of the sessions from that holiness series on YouTube. One, because I believe in the message and I feel like it's timely. Two, it gave me a month off to write another book. So it's finished and in editing phase right now. I hope to have it out in the next several months. We'll see. Um, I'm not trying to rush the editor who is my wife and uh, she's the only one I feel like can edit the book at this point because of the content. But anyway, again, I'll mention that more uh, as the weeks and the months come and we get closer to the release date for that. But until then, you can still pick up my book, Hearing Love, which is a commentary on the greatest commandment to hear the Lord, to know him and respond in love. So that book is available for purchase on my website along with all the teaching that's available for free. And then you can download the instrumental music that I record and play underneath this channel to help undergird prayer, meditation, reading. And so all those links are on my website and I'll link that below in the description so you can go visit the website. And then you can also support the ministry if you like the channel, if you enjoy the channel, if you believe in the message of the channel, then any support is appreciated uh, whether that's on Patreon, which has some older content. I haven't been posting much on Patreon presently, but there's still some older stuff on there. And then there's ways to uh, give through the ministry at the local level as well. But anyway, all that's on the website. Also, I will mention my wife's CP. I'm going to put a link to that on the website and that will be down below in the description. A few years ago, my wife and I recorded five songs together and not a lot of people know about it because she didn't really publicize it. And so in addition to the music that I do, I've recorded with my wife and I hope to have more projects with her coming up because uh, it's a lot of fun to record with my wife. In this video, you'll have to bear with me because it's gonna be long and I'm going to finally respond to uh, the accusations against Mike Bickle, many of the others in Kansas City, and everything that's been coming out that I've been watching. Um, I haven't really responded other than a generic response in a previous video uh, where I was mainly doing a review on the Ballers movie last fall that Daily Wire released, but uh, I've really, I don't, I've held my tongue because it's just like I'm an outsider and I don't want to get into the gossip swirl. I don't want to pretend like I'm investigating something by watching other people's videos. And uh, it's just, it's such a heartbreaking, heartbreaking scenario. And so my posture has really been silence, watch, and pray, but not watching out of insecurity, but just watching out of concern. My biggest concern out of all this is the atheists that this is going to create and what this is going to do specifically to the message of holiness. And so now the sermons I've been uploading this last month while I've been writing this next book is an interesting series to me considering the timing of everything that's gone on at IHOP. And the reason I'm responding to it now is I do have an online presence and some of you have asked me, like, what do I think about what's going on up there? Especially in light of, I'm a House of Prayer director and I've directed a House of Prayer for 10 years now. We're coming up on 10 years this summer. I've been a part of the prayer movement. I've loved IHOP and uh, gleaned from them from afar. I've never been an insider in that community. Um, I do have some relationships within it, but they're not my closest relationships just because, I mean, practically distance doesn't really make for close relationships. So the leaders and the friends that I have are here in San Antonio, in my city, the folks that I know face to face. Anyway, in the past, I've done videos where I've appealed to IHOP because of their sobriety with how they stewarded the prophetic gifts. Um, or the spiritual gifting, um, how they weren't the typical out of control charismatic environment. Uh, they had a depth of teaching that really cared for and honored the word. And, uh, and I'm not just talking about Mike, I'm talking about the plurality of teachers that they've had there through the years. Some I've been like, I don't know about that guy. He just seems kind of like your typical charismatic, non-denominational, not that deep and doesn't really have much to say type guys, but there's been other guys like Alan Hood has so much of my respect. Corey Russell still has so much of my respect. Um, I've always loved Stephen Venable and there's been uh, many teachers from there. Kirk Bennett's another one that I've uh, enjoyed listening to. There's been many teachers from there that uh, I feel like I've, I've drawn from and still honor, still respect. Um, and still appreciate their teaching ministry. And so anyway, their depth of the word, their honor for the word, their 
their prophetic vision and the teaching gift, their stewarding of the spiritual atmosphere as charismatics, that was the ministry that kept me from leaving the charismatic movement as a whole when all I just saw was this shallow, stupid, new age circus with no plumb line of truth anywhere. Like, and that's still just such an epidemic in our own movement, whether it's charismatics or non-denominational, um, usually both. And it's such a vast community and no one really dives deep into understanding complex things. And so we've got so much theology and maxims and platitudes that just clash and constantly contradict. And it's like, we don't even care because we just want to let go of our head and feel the spirit. And so. I did not see that culture at IHOP through the years after I became a Christian. And so I've really grown to respect IHOP in Kansas City. The 24-7 prayer room made sense to me because when I fell in love with Jesus, he had my heart, my affections, and internally, like m me, the temple of God, my body, my mind, my heart, I was already living in that reality of 24-7 prayer and worship. And so when there's a corporate expression of that, like, dear God, that's beautiful. It just, it made so much sense and it captured my attention. And so they've had a deep respect and I've mentioned them several times in videos appealing to their sobriety and their depth and their carefulness. And then some of my local friends or folks that know like, hey, you direct a house of prayer and you're involved in the prayer movement. Um, like, what is your response? Like, how are you taking all this in? So I hope to answer all of that without getting gossipy. Like, I really don't want to get gossipy. This has led me to more prayer than speaking. But the reason I'm doing this video is not just to appease those questions of people that feel like I need to give a response. I want to get into some of the differences that I've maintained from IHOP through the years that makes a whole lot more sense now. And I think some of these differences could bring healing to the prayer movement um, if we could examine these doctrinal issues and some of the differences that I've had. And so I'm gonna get into a whole lot of topics. So again, this is gonna be a longer video. This might be one of those like, get yourself a meal, pop some healthy popcorn, or just take it in chunks. Uh, because uh, I'm, I'm gonna be saying a lot. I do wanna stay focused, but I also don't wanna get in a rush again, because this is, Man, this is such a sensitive issue to me. And again, it's just caused me to weep um, a lot. It's caused me to get angry a lot. Um, and it's even caused me to get numb. Like when the reports from Misty Edwards started coming out, I'm just like, can I even feel what's happening anymore? And so it's been a really, really difficult season. Now that holiness series that I've been posting on YouTube that I started back in the fall, uh, the very first session of that, when I taught through Hebrews 12, the Lord that week just was burning holiness into my heart as a local community mainly. And it, I always had the larger body of Christ in my mind uh, to some degree because there's a little bit of influence on YouTube. Not, not a whole lot, like let's be real. My channel's pretty small potatoes, so it's not that big of a deal. But uh, it, mainly in the local community, just really feeling like, no, we're not going to let this holiness thing go. We are a holiness people, and this is leading us into like the most fulfilled, joyful, just content, full of thanksgiving, like happy, full of praise, just healthy people. Like holiness is health. You're sanctified unto God through his word. His divine life comes in and makes you happy and holy and healthy and just all these things are not mutually exclusive but there's just like the fruit of a beautiful bud um, for a life that's completely devoted to God and so anyway just doubling down on this holiness message and the Saturday morning I'm writing out the sermon after just preparing all week and I'm getting ready to preach that night that morning is when the news came to me of what was going on at IHOP with the accusations at Mike Bickle now that completely just crushed me and immediately I just felt like even though that wasn't me uh, being accused, like I'm a part of the prayer movement and Mike Bickle someone who taught a radical living message. He taught holiness. A little bit different than I've taught holiness through the years and I'll get into that, but um, he still taught holiness and I really appreciated him for that. That's one of the things I loved about IHOP was their call to holiness. But that morning when the news came out, I remember just being crushed and then feeling like such a hypocrite. Like, here's what's going on in my movement 
uh, so to speak, where I'm like tied to this prayer movement. Here's what's going on. And I just felt like such a hypocrite. Like I can't preach holiness now. Like what's that? Like I'm sure word's going to start getting out and people are going to know. And, you know, I decided not to make a statement about anything because our house of prayer is kind of unique. We have a bunch of people that have found us and come that don't know anything about IHOP. Um, a few of us know stuff about IHOP and then, uh, smaller few are really involved with like you know streaming the prayer room and we've read a lot of books from ihop and gone through a lot of their teaching and, and their courses and stuff and so there's a small few of us that have been really uh, deeper impacted by ihop but for the sake of those that don't even know ihop and probably didn't even know what was going on i just felt like it was best to leave things unsaid and not let people know stuff's going on that they didn't even know about in the first place because i don't want them to worry or like get into, I, I don't know, I just felt like it was best to just stay silent and, and wait and, and see what happens. And you know, my central theme in all of this has been like, Mike is a man. Um, all these others who have fallen or confessed or whatever, all the drama that's going on up there, like they're just men and they're not God. Like my eyes are on Jesus and he's my example. I'm gonna be holy because he's holy. The Bible doesn't say be holy because Mike Bickle's holy. God says be holy for I am holy. Um, and so anyway, just eyes on Jesus. He's my example. No matter what men and women rise and fall, like Jesus is my example. And so that's really been where I've set my, my heart. But that day was just such a struggle because it's like, how am I gonna preach holiness? Because one, what does this do to the credibility of the message where people have seen this guy preach holiness and radical living for decades? And then all of a sudden, the details of what's continued to come out just erode the credibility of that message. And so I just had such a conviction of the Lord, like, don't let this go. Holiness matters. Hold on to this. And so what initially was just going to be one sermon on Hebrews 12, I'm still in a holiness series um, during the times that I'm preaching here at our local ministry and I've just been doubling down on holiness and and what that looks like getting into the whys and some of the doctrinal issues and some of the objections and the beauty of holy living and um, getting into the depth of this because I feel like it's something we really have to un to understand because as information's come out about IHOP the things that I'm reading of statements people are making or even the text messages and back and forth between Misty Edwards and this other guy um, that was in the one of the latest articles that came out I saw a profound misunderstanding of holiness even in someone like a Misty Edwards who we in the prayer movement has looked at as this person that gave her life for holiness for radical living because of the urgency of the hour and so maybe her emphasis was more on the urgency and not the holiness. But that was one of the things I began to notice was there was such a gaping hole in people's understanding of holiness, even in the charismatic movement that is really from the holiness movement. You trace our modern charismatic roots back really to the revivals of Methodism. And we were birthed out of a holiness movement. And now that's taken on many forms and kind of changed over the years. And I feel like the Lord's really calling us back to ancient paths to understand holiness as it's meant to be. And you know, IHOP, I feel like they put a lot of emphasis of the urgency of the hour as pertaining to end times. And that's why we're holy. We wanna be radically living and giving our lives and ready for the second coming of Christ. And you know, it's been years and years and years and of things unfolding and maybe people are getting patient or disillusioned or like, why are we doing this? Why did I give all this up? And you know, Jesus isn't back yet. And so we're like looking more at the second coming than we are at the beauty and the holiness of God um, and kind of losing sight on, on, of what holiness is. So I'll say, as far as my end time views, like I'm still a historic premillennialist, but I focus mainly on the victorious church. And then this would be my difference with IHOP on the victorious church with a view to prophecy being based on law and therefore contingent and not fatalistic. And so that's why I, I would say in videos past, especially when the coronavirus hit and we look at the judgments of the Lord like beginning to manifest in the land, we are in the end times, but we don't have to be if we don't want to be. If our nation repents, we can come under restoration and walk in a land that's victorious and in our day and age. And so I don't see the end times as this fatalistic seven years that's just gonna seize on us 
without the involvement of humans. Uh, will we get there one day? Probably so, but my focus is on the victorious church, understanding prophecy as contingent, and begin to engage the spheres of influence that we have to bring restoration, revival, and redemption to men, women, and creation. And so that's where my focus on the end times is. And so my urgency of holiness is on my friendship with God to be able to partner with him now to bring restoration and not just kind of huddled up in a prayer room waiting for Jesus to come, which I believe he's gonna come. Again, I'm still a historic premillennialist, but uh, again, that, that takes a back seat to the victorious church right now, understanding prophecy is contingent based on the law. If I'm losing you with that statement, I can link a video down in the description that I did. Actually, better yet, I'll link a series that I did called the Controverse Series that gets into how we differ from the mainstream charismatic movement. Um, that comes down to original sin, things we think about holiness, uh, how we apply the law of the Lord in the context of the new covenant believer. And then because of that, prophecy is something that massively distinguishes us from your normal charismatic group. I get into details there that I'm not gonna be able to get into for the sake of this video. Now, as information's come out and you have the videos from the advocacy group that are uh, representing the Jane Doe's that we're calling them, and then you see how things are handled or different pieces of information that's coming out, uh, what's interesting to me is the accountability and the leadership piece and the communication piece, how communication was siloed so that there was no real clear accountability, way to bring things up that were concerns. And it, it's kind of gone undetected. And I feel like it's not just IHOP, but it's just a non-denominational type um, understanding of things where we're thinking like, we need to be under covering, we need to be under accountability. And too often that means that my small ministry is submitted to this big ministry to give me all my doctrine, tell me how to think and tell us how we should operate or you know, give us the prophetic word for right now. Um, and so we're submitted to this organizational institution that we like the faces and the personalities, but we don't know them personally, but we're submitted to this institution in another state or in another country in a faraway land and we're submitted to them as our covering. This is like a normal way of thinking in the charismatic movement, but uh, I've wrestled through these questions because people will come to our ministry and like, well, who are you ordained through? And who's your covering? And who are you submitted to? And who are you accountable to? And honestly, like, I feel like there's a healthier accountability structure for ministries in general. Uh, I appreciate being able to draw things from a bigger institution that has the resource to put out material but like that's not accountability like someone in a distant land telling me how to think that's not accountability accountability is the relationships that i have face to face and so there are pastors and other leaders in this city that i know face to face that i meet with face to face that we know one another in addition to that at our local ministry we're not like a pastor-led ministry we're a board of elders led ministry and even though like i'll say senior pastor for myself because that's just the terminology like people are used to i pastor our leaders here but my main function is as the senior elder in the midst of a board of elders that where we're submitted to one another, we talk to one another. And even with that, we have other pastors that and deacons that are within that network of leadership. And we're constantly talking and like, what's the Lord saying? And bringing up concerns to one another, repenting to one another and uh, having those relationships in place. Like to me, that's accountability. Um, and even the folks that sit on an accountability board for our organizational piece, they're men that I know face to face that I have relationships with at different levels. And at any time, if something's going weird with the board of elders at the local ministry, like people can go to that accountability board and uh, uh, appeal to them as well. And so I think communication was really, it, it, Kansas City, it seemed like communication was siloed and there wasn't a great accountability structure set up in place. There was all these calls for scriptural protocol for making things right with your brother or your sister and all these private meetings and stuff. And it seemed like scripture was being twisted to use that protocol to manipulate uh, is what can be gathered on the front end. Now, again, I wanna 
kind of refrain from trying to be the investigator and trying to get into gossip mode. But uh, again, these are just things I'm noticing as an outsider who's reading the information, not really seeking the information to know every detail because again like my eyes are on Jesus but understanding how their structure was set in place and then understanding the traditional non-denominational or charismatic like mindset of submission to covering I think that's something we need to rethink that we really need to rethink if you're the senior leader at your ministry and you don't have any friends um, and leaders that surround you that you're actively in fellowship with because you're the guy up in charge and you're so high you're such a high officer that you can't fraternize with any of the normal people that's dysfunctional and I don't I don't think that's a good good thing at all now we know like no one has the time to be everyone's friend all the time and so you have to be very selective but you still need an open communication like a, a leadership structure that's based on fellowship with open communication where there's repentance uh, constant reconciliation but it seems like their communication networks were so small like things are happening within the organization like the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing and uh because of that, people were being able to be manipulated through the control of information. So again, the leadership structure, like accountability is not submission to doctrines from some out of state big institution. Read your own Bible and stay in fellowship with people that know you face to face. I think that's one of the greatest safeguards against this. And every every church leader should have friends in that church so that the people you lead can see your manner of life they can see your manner of speech they can see like if you're hanging out and some inappropriate woman walks by they can see you look the other way or you can throw the red flag of like looking at them up and down and then they're like why is my pastor checking out that woman over there? But uh, anyway, like you need to be in relationship with people face to face. That's that's real accountability. And read your own Bible. And in those relationships, everyone seeking the Lord together. Don't wait for some institution to tell you what to believe or how to think. But you all like run together. Go deep in the Word together. Deep in friendship. Deep in the Word. Deep in prayer together. And uh, just stay committed to those things. And when you sin, repent to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. That That's accountability to me. I th would assume that would have been up at IHOP, but you know, that would have just been, that's just my assumption through the years. But after all this has come out, this is one of the differences. Um, that I didn't know was there that is obviously there between our house of prayer and their house of prayer. Now, I will say because of some of these differences, we've always maintained some sort of a distance and uh, autonomy, really focused on our local network being the accountability and our covering through relationship. Now, after all this stuff coming out, like I've appreciated I I'd so deeply appreciate the autonomy that we've had throughout the years for the Lord's hand to be on us, to bring us into the place that we're at uh, currently. So I I'm deeply grateful to the Lord for that now looking back. Now now it makes sense. You know, five years ago, it's like, man, we feel like we're all alone out here and we had relationships, you know, here locally. But as far as like the global prayer movement, there were some ties, but it was like, man, we feel so alone. But now it's like, huh, thank the Lord we felt alone and we were focused on the local community. Now, I say I've been a house of prayer director for 10 years. Um, it took a few years, but our ministry really began to naturally shift into a church. And so, yes, we keep a prayer room, but now the goal of the prayer room is not 24-7. The goal of the prayer room is a prayer culture in the context of a tight-knit community where we fellowship together. And so we're doing all the other churchy things. We have the fellowship groups that are our primary place of pastoral care and discipleship and uh, facilitating friendships. Uh, yes, we do have the prayer meetings for a constant culture of prayer. We want to be devoted to prayer. Um, we still have our church service where we do church service-y things. Now we have a three-hour service because we want to make sure we do some business with the Lord. Sometimes we end early, sometimes we go late, and sometimes we end on time. But, uh, but uh, we just we have a great time with the Lord. And then this next piece that I'm going to be moving into is just going door to door, knocking on doors, starting neighborhood Bible studies. And so how do we balance the fullness of 
all the kingdom things that the church should be doing um, for their fellowship and for the community that they're, they're in. And so that's really where my mind is at now. It's not exclusively on being a house of prayer for the city. It's on those who fellowship together, how do we maintain a culture of prayer? That's really been able to happen naturally because of our distance that we've maintained from IHOP. But uh, I will say, just like we've maintained distance, the prayer movement and the 24-7 prayer thing is bigger than IHOP. It started before IHOP. There's a deep history to the 24-7 prayer movement. There were several other ministries that started independent from IHOP that didn't even know what was going on in Kansas City. And then years later, they meet up and find out like, oh, you started on the same day we did. I remember a prayer ministry in, I think it was the UK that started the exact same day that IHOP started. And uh, with the with a very similar vision of going 24-7. And then years later they met up and then as IHOP missionaries went out um, to other nations, like this was something that was happening organically already independent from IHOP. They just became a great hub for training, sending missionaries out to be able to raise up houses of prayer um, and then just helping to quit the larger prayer movement. And so they became kind of a central hub, but set that aside for a second and the prayer movement is something that was already happening independent from IHOP. IHOP did have a lot of influence and helped out greatly, uh, but it is not an IHOP KC movement. It is a Jesus movement. And again, the reason the Kansas City Prayer Room got my attention when I heard that they were 24 seven and I began to watch their live stream is it was already a reality in me personally. So when I found out, Again, the corporate reality of it, just like this makes so much sense. And so I'm going to give my life to that. And now I think several years later, again, the Lord's shifting us into being a church. So I'm still living that personally, but there's many other things that Jesus said to do, like go into all nations and make disciples to love one another. And so bringing in all these beautiful kingdom aspects to reflect the fullness of Christ in our local context. And so that's, that's where we are now. And that's been such a beautiful journey. And even now, modern day in the prayer movement, what's happening globally is not unlike what's happened to us in our ministry. There are several churches that are feeling the necessity and the calling to create a deep culture of prayer and are opening up prayer rooms within the context of their local ministry. So you have churches that are becoming houses of prayer. You have houses of prayer like we've been that have been shifting into becoming churches. And you have this other phenomenon of you have an independent church and an independent house of prayer that meet each other, fall in love, and merge together to bring the two cultures together as one. And this is going on all over the place. And this is something independent from IHOP as well. And I think that's really where the hand of the Lord is in this season of bringing the prayer movement back into the church. Uh, I think for a long time, us in the prayer movement, especially you know when we started 10 years ago, it was like the Lord brought a prayer room out from the church culture to raise it up because the church culture really had a tight grip on many things and uh, the prayer room could not grow up inside the church. And so it's like kind of the Ark of the Covenant in a sense has been taken from the midst of the church and we kind of saw it as like, this is what the Lord's doing now. This is the Lord's done with church as usual. But uh, really what's happened through the years is you have this prayer movement that's matured and now the Lord's bringing that prayer movement back inside the walls of the church to complete her in a fuller sense so that we can maintain the simplicity of just that Acts 2.42 of where we're devoted to prayer, to teaching and the word, to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and going house to house, like all those beautiful aspects and just being devoted to all of the things, not one over the other, um, but understanding the order of these things and a devotion to all these things bring such a beautiful life. Because we've done the prayer ministry for years that was disconnected from fellowship, disconnected from evangelism, disconnected from breaking of bread and the table of the Lord. And uh, I don't wanna do it that way ever again. Like I love the fullness of the body of Christ and I love the fullness of his presence in our midst. I love the fullness of what he's called us to. And it's just the simple daily life of kingdom activity um, as we all fellowship around Jesus. So I, I feel like that's what the Lord is doing now. And the main point here is that the prayer movement was not IHOP's movement. It's still not IHOP's movement. And you even have these other things that I feel like the Lord's been preparing the prayer movement 
um, even for this exposure in these last several years to come back into the walls of the church to begin to shift the paradigm of why we gather so that when we go out to outreach, it's much more effective. So instead of just a prayer room that doesn't outreach or an outreach church that doesn't pray, like bringing them both together to be one. And so this is a beautiful thing, and this is bigger than IHOP Kansas City. And so as devastating as this is, as much discredit as this brings to the message, like the idea of a 24-7 prayer room is a beautiful thing. Uh, the idea of a culture of prayer in the church is a beautiful thing. And Jesus, this is still Jesus' movement. Jesus is the one who said, my house will be a house of prayer. Mike Bickle's not the one who said Jesus' house would be the house of prayer. Like he quoted Jesus, um, men rise and fall, but Jesus is still the one. My father's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And so this is still his movement, and he's the one who called me into his movement. And uh, this is still where I will be found. Now, another thing that it's brought to me personally in seeing the exposure and what's going on is just a massive fear of the Lord. Like my heart breaks at the conscience of those that are being affected, um, who were impacted at different degrees, but now seeing the message just completely discredited as they put so much trust or, I mean, no one wants to say I trust Mike or I put you know, a man on a pedestal, but we kind of do that in our heart in subtle ways so that when they come crashing down, it, it really is devastating. And so I know the wrestle that's going on, that's gotta be going on inside so many people's hearts and minds with like, is holiness even possible? And so like, my heart really goes out to those, but especially so the little children, like that are going to be hearing things uh, they might not know all the details now, but grow up and find out more details. And like the children who are brought up in this and really loved and trusted a leader, like you have a spiritual leader in a position of great influence and not just, you know, shaping how people think, but you look at a child and like you're shaping how they think. And when you do that to a child, you're shaping how they're being developed and what they grow into. And so for that to be a part of their developmental experience, like, oh my Lord, like, please, like, guard me, keep me. Like, don't let me be that example to a child. And so it's just put an even greater fear of the Lord over me, not just for the sake of the adults, which is, you know, tragic in its own right, but for the sake of the children, which is deeply tragic, which is deeply harmful. And I'm just like, goodness gracious, what are these kids got to be going through? And so like children's church pastors, youth leaders, like other pastors, like any form of leadership, like where the kids look up to you and they think that you're cool. Um, they hear the words that are coming out of your mouth. I mean, I've got elementary school kids that understand what I'm saying and pay attention and give me feedback many times to my sermons that are like an hour to an hour and a half long. And uh, we have a great atmosphere that I feel like we have a lot of engaged parents and leaders that have taught the kids how to engage the Lord in even the midst of a three-hour church service where the kids are engaged in worship. They're hearing the Lord speak. They're singing to Him. Um, they're being able to pay attention to the degree that they can. And these kids are smart and they pick up on things. And I'm just like, the fear of the Lord over my life to not be an example like that to them is just like... I cannot do that. Like for the sake of the children, like woe to him who causes one of these little ones to stumble. And so that's been on my heart huge is just this massive fear of the Lord over my own soul. Um, and then even just watching our own leadership team and our congregation, like how we treat the kids and what is the example that we don't just live before the kids, but even behind closed doors, like how that stuff is going to affect the kids. If like, if there's in, any failure, like it's just, I just, I am scared of God because of that. And I love him. I love him dearly and he's a close friend, but that scares me. And the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, it says in Proverbs. Everyone quotes the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And they're like, oh yeah, I fear the Lord and it'll make you smart. And you know, that's fine. I don't want to downplay that too much, but it's like, we don't focus on the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Like hate it enough to not do it, run from it, flee from it, be repelled by it. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And I just had this massive, like fresh season of the fear of the Lord resting over my soul for the sake of the conscience of children. What a responsibility. 
What a responsibility. And the Lord sees it all. <sighs> and we're all going to get to stand before him um, on that day. Wow. So fear, fear of the Lord. That's been probably one of the biggest things for me personally that I've just been like, I have a massive responsibility with these kids that are in our midst. Now to my doctrinal differences, and this is again one of the reasons why we've kept some distance from IHOP, because I've just had some doctrinal differences from them and typical mainstream charismatics. Again, through the years I've always appreciated how they stewarded, stewarded a spiritual environment in sobriety. Um, but now that the information's coming out, it's like, yeah, they had like this conservative outward form um, that I had respect for. Uh, but it seems like because of what they taught about prophecy and their communication within leadership being siloed, it created this weird context for the misunderstanding of prophecy to not just be misapplied, but used very manipulatively. And then what created the context for prophecy to be used manipulatively, I feel like, is some of the things that's come out as I've seen some of the conversations and the confessions and, and the articles from whether it was uh, Mrs. Woods or Misty's thing, is there was a deep misunderstanding of holiness, flesh, and divine nature and original sin. Now, because I differ on original sin from IHOP, they still had, even though they taught against Platonic thinking um, for the sake of their theology of the 24 seven prayer room, they didn't teach against it when it came to living holy and living free from sin. And so the very beginning point is starts with what you think happened at the original sin. And so they saw Adam's transgression being passed down as a punishment and even like a DNA through like a type of DNA transmission that um, not all, but like a very select few of some of the early-ish, not early, but early-ish church fathers like Augustine who thought that the uh, man passed sin nature onto the children through the seed of the man. and. You know, they didn't understand biology then, so they didn't think that a woman's body played really any part other than like growing the seed of the man. But now we know that the woman contributes the egg, right? So there's both. So that argument doesn't really hold, hold water and it was never in scripture anyway. But uh, anyway, because of that, they still had this dualistic holiness message that uh, the reformers are very good at carrying. Like if you listen to Paul Washer and many of the reformers, they'll preach holiness but they'll also preach, yeah, but you're just a worm and you'll never really be holy. And so as I'm reading through the information that's coming out, the text messages, again, some of the articles and confessions by people and how Mike would conduct himself uh, in certain emails or whatever, there seemed to be this sin nature consciousness that they were never cleansed from where it's like, yeah, we're gonna give our lives radically in the context of an urgent end time scenario, but as far as taking up my cross to die and literally setting aside sin nature, clothing yourself with Christ, being renewed in, your, in the spirit of your mind to put on divine nature, they never saw it like that. They, it seems like they still saw it as this dualistic, like I'm always a sinner and I'm always in the flesh and they're conflating flesh with sin nature, uh, which you should not do. And so because they saw themselves as sinners, some of this prof prophetic manipulation was all centered around like, well, I'm still just a sinner and now I'm using this prophetic thing. So it was a misunderstanding of sin, a misunderstanding of what the prophetic actually is, and using that misunderstanding to manipulate, justifying it through, yeah, we're all sinners. And then on top of that, you have that unaccountable environment where leadership's not really communicating to each other. And just, it seems like this whole messy thing, but it's like I can see even now the doctrinal differences that's kind of kept us a little bit farther removed than other houses of prayer. Um, other prayer ministries. It's kept us more at a distance from IHOP. Um, and there's always been through the years, it's like, well, Mike's such a well-respected teacher and a lot of the stuff that comes from IHOP, like people really believe that. And, you know, I want to honor them as like, I mean, they're, they seem like they know what they're doing. And I'm just little old me here in San Antonio. I wasn't that flashy about what I believe uh, when people would come and visit our house of prayer. I was 
tried to be real careful with how I would present certain doctrines because there's always in the back of my mind, even though I do believe differently about holiness, about sin nature, about prophecy, and about uh, spiritual accountability and leadership structures. Like I, th I think differently about all those things because of what I've read in the Bible. And uh, I know IHOP's different, so I always had in the back of my mind, well, like Mike believes this, and I know most of the prayer movement kind of agrees with Mike on these issues, so I'd always try to be careful. But if there's any good for me that's come out of this is it's been like, a, okay, I see the harm that actually those differences we had, I see the harm that it did in their context. And so now I am much bolder about my beliefs on sin nature, especially within the prayer movement. You're born innocent, and because you're born innocent and you made you a sinner, Adam didn't make you a sinner, but you made you a sinner. And because of that, it puts a new lens on redemption even, and that you can live holy, you can live free from sin. Yeah, we're all gonna die because we haven't put on immortality yet. That day is still coming, but you can live free from sin. You can renew your nature and be completely redeemed back unto the Lord's original intent and design for you. And so one of the greatest scriptures is when Paul told the Corinthians, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God will, provide a way of escape every time so that you can endure it. And so that one verse places the accountability for sin back on you and not this dualistic platonic, well, it's my flesh sinning and Jesus sees my spirit is clean. Uh, I would take up issue with that. Like if you're, your flesh is sinning, that is your word becoming flesh. And so purify your word according to his word. Renew your mind according to Christ. So again, these last few months, it's made sense why the Lord's had me focus so much on holiness. And you know, the book that I mentioned at the beginning of the video that I'm in the process of writing, it is a holiness book, but I'm targeting a specific audience with it. And there'll be more coming out around the book, but uh, and I just feel like it's a season to really grab a hold of the holiness message and give people hope. Like, you can be holy. You can live free from these things. And so at the beginning, when I just felt so insecure and felt like a hypocrite for preaching holiness, uh, the Lord just really just had his hand on my heart. Like, no, you stay faithful. Like, you preach the word. And it was so hard to get up that night and preach the first session of the holiness series while in the back of my mind my heart is just broken and thinking about Mike Bickle and IHOP Kansas City the whole time and just like wanting to weep but also just preaching holiness and being faithful um, but again I think these differences that I've had and I don't I don't mean to like put myself up on a pedestal like I don't want you to lead people to me but like you you search these things out you you do it and then you influence your sphere. And uh, I think this is an important conversation, especially in the prayer movement. I think these things can bring deep healing. We have to re-examine like these holiness aspects and the doctrines that really underlay that so that we can understand and live actually holy and not like try to live radical because of an end time urgency while we're also seeing ourselves as sinners and I won't be holy. So it's like we have this divorce between like, I'm going to live radical by giving my life to the prayer room, but I'm not going to be holy. And uh, just that those two cannot coexist together. Like do one in the same, like you can be holy. And I feel like there would be healing for our prayer movement if we could re-examine that. Um, even re-examine what we've always thought about prophecy. I'm not gonna get into too much, but I would say the definition of prophecy is Jeremiah chapter one. And prophetic vision is always tied to the law. So prophecy is for tearing down the lies and the arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge of Christ, and then to build and fortify the knowledge of God in your generation. So when you understand the law, you understand that his judgments will come into a land that acts in a certain manner. If you repent, then you understand the blessing that will come into the land in a certain manner. You understand how to tear down lies and arguments to set people free from demons. Like coming back to a law-based prophetic culture that understands the ways of the Lord and then also understands through the lens of contingent prophecy like Nineveh. Uh, when Jonah prophesied the city will be destroyed in 40 days, but it didn't happen because they repented. So that's what I mean by contingent prophecy. It's that who knows of Joel? Like, who knows if the Lord will leave a, a blessing? And the who knows is on you. Well, you turn and repent. 
Will you cry, will you come and kneel down and weep between the porch and the altar? Will you give yourself to fasting? Will the people respond and do that? That's the who knows. And so coming back to this law-based contingent prophecy for a victorious church that knows how to leave, live holy and set up healthy leadership structures that are based on fellowship, friendship, and communication. I think if we re-examine those three, those arenas, we could create the context to preserve and bring healing and restoration to the prayer movement. Um, I think it would affect more than just the prayer movement, but we seem to be really kind of shocked by what's going on right now. And we still have the language of like the hyper grace culture even infiltrating our midst and we don't know where it came from. We don't recognize the reformed Calvinist seeds that are growing to full bloom. We don't recognize, you know, what's heresy or what's orthodox theology and knowing Christian history. We don't understand the guys like John Wesley or Charles Finney who came in to begin to bring the Protestant church back to center theologically that's actually bringing us closer to full circle back to the Eastern Orthodox theology. Now this that's not a stamp of approval on Eastern Orthodox theology, but I'm talking about like the theology of the early church fathers, not the stuff that you read about in 300 and 400, but the stuff before that, the fathers before that, that sound like they're all arguing with Calvinists because they're all arguing against Gnostics and Platonic philosophers. But um, anyway, I, th I think these things would bring a deep healing and a deep unity and uh, more on these issues to come in the Holiness series and future writings and everything. I know I didn't really unpack everything. Uh, if you're a charismatic and you really are, would like to understand the prophetic thing I'm talking about, again, the link to the series where I discuss prophecy will be down in the description. And then if you guys have other questions, please ask. But so far, that's kind of my... It doesn't feel like super congruent, but that's still just the stuff that's going on in my heart. Uh, with seeing from a distance what's been going on at IHOP, how I'm responding as an individual, and how I'm responding as the senior leader at our ministry, having been someone that's directed a house of prayer for the last 10 years. I think there is hope, I think there is healing, I think there's still even hope and healing for uh, Mike and Misty and whoever's involved at whatever degree, but I think it comes down to these aspects of coming to a place where you are actually practically holy and living in a place of health from that launching pad. And so anyway, will, will we get there? I, I hope and I, I pray so. I know the things that the Lord's laid on my heart. I constantly meet people that are uh, on the same journey as myself. And so that's encouraging. So I feel like this is something that the Lord's doing independent from me. I don't claim to have some sort of like grasp of like I'm the only one teaching these things but uh, I feel like it's time to as a charismatic community to really care about theology to really care about doctrine and actually begin to have an answer for our accusers and even videos like this as much as I want to keep my mouth shut I don't want to say anything I don't want to put out a statement um, the fact is like you have the reform Calvinist community who's just having a heyday, pointing their fingers and like saying, see, I told you, you know, these guys were charlatans. I told you that they were false prophets and they were preaching a false gospel and all this stuff. And so they're pointing at all the IHOP sin while they themselves also will say that they're a sinner and they sin every day. But anyway, like there's so many videos out there. I hesitated to throw something, but Maybe, maybe this is helpful, just my perspective. Again, I'm not trying to pretend to investigate, but the things that I have read, I'm like noticing these subtle doctrinal differences that I've held throughout the years. Like these have become like the major issues that created such a context for this tragedy to happen. And uh, I feel like if we focused on these as a movement and as a greater body of Christ, feel like again there could be a deep healing so thanks again for watching a long video with me all the links i mentioned my website the book music everything will be in the description and uh, i'll see you guys again next week bye